I know when we first started this series now four weeks ago, I asked you what your favorite uh, Bible story was, one that you remembered from your childhood. I'm not sure that uh, we've, we've checked all the boxes yet. I think we have about another seven weeks or so. And while we, we have the, the lineup, somewhat decided if you say, Pastor, this was my favorite. And if I look and say, oh, it's not on the list, maybe towards the end, uh, I would be happy to include that. So you can email me or talk to me uh, after the service or in the coming weeks. Let's pray. Gracious fathers, we think about the Bible. It's not a random collection of stories, but rather it is a singular story in which many stories are a part of that. And ultimately, it is a story about you, of your love, and of your transforming grace. And as we consider your word today, we pray that you would, by your spirit, grant us new insights not only into the text, but also that we would rediscover things about ourselves and more so about the way in which you work in people's lives, including our own, for which we are grateful. And pray that you would always be leading us by your spirit into truth and that we would rest more securely in the grace that is ours. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In terms of Bible stories to read to children, probably Rahab is not high on the list. Uh, when we read it, we talk about the, the two spies. Even though they're not mentioned by name, we talk about the two spies as opposed to the, the story is really dominated by a woman named Rahab. And so what happens when we read this story to kids, and I remember reading it at some point to, to Noah and Michael, when we read this story to kids, a story that has brilliant colors, we, we kind of mute those colors. And there are, of course, good reasons for that, as we've discussed in previous weeks, that there is a genuine desire on our part to make the Word of God understandable to kids. However, in our pursuit to make the word of God simple enough for young minds to grasp, we trend towards the simplistic. And as a result, we take a story that is vibrant and lively and colorful and make it a dreary mix of gray. And quite frankly, if, if that's all it is, why do we even bother reading it to our kids? Because the way I look at it, it makes it seem as if God and his work in time and space are dull and boring. And is that really what we want to communicate to our sons and daughters and our grandchildren and the others that the Lord would entrust to us in this place? We also tend to mute the colors of the story because we want to avoid kids asking us, well, embarrassing questions. <laughs> Uh, the kind that may leave our faces a little scarlet colored. Now, having raised two boys, I, I, I appreciate the sensitivities that are required when it comes to this Bible story and many other Bible stories, quite frankly. And yet we need to be careful that in our pursuit not to become embarrassed, that we whitewash the text. Because we need to keep in mind the Lord of heaven and earth is not embarrassed to have the story of Rahab in the scriptures. In addition, the more whitewash we use, the more difficult it is for us to see the scarlet cords of God's grace that touch this woman's heart and transform her life. Now, speaking of Rahab's life, we, we really don't know that much about her. I mean, we don't read of her husband or children. We read of her parents and of her siblings and their families. 
And we don't know why it is that she came to that point in her life where she supports herself and others by selling her body. Undoubtedly, due to the circumstances of life, she had no choice. And sitting comfortably where we do, living where we do, with all kinds of options, it's very easy for us to sit in judgment upon her. However, I hope that all of us would see that today's story is not so much calling her character into question. Rather, we ought to call the character of the other inhabitants of the city of Jericho into question. Since they were unwilling to help meet her needs, since they likely didn't provide her with any other options, and it's still true for many women today, she had no choice but to resort to prostitution. As I was prayerfully pondering today's Old Testament text over the last week or two, there was a singular word that came to mind, and that word is use. And I think that that word well describes Rahab. She was used. She was used by travelers who came to the city of Jericho who were looking for a little female companionship. She was used by some of the men of Jericho who had that proverbial itch to scratch. She was likely used by others as the butt of jokes. If they had posters, she would have been the poster child. She would have been used as the poster child for what not to be. But she was used. The trouble is that people didn't treat her as a person, but used her as a thing for selfish pleasure. That people didn't see her as a person, but as an emblem of shame. If Paul Harvey were here, he'd say, well, that's, you know, for the rest of the story, because that's really only part of her story, and, and that's the part of the story maybe we remember most. But if that's all we remember about Rahab, we see her in one dimension, that there is another side to the story, and there is a more glorious uh, ending to her life story. Yes, she was used by men for their selfish pleasure. Remarkably, though, she was also used by the Lord for his good pleasure. Yes, she suffered shame at the hands of others, but in God's hand, she was ultimately used for his glory. Do you believe that? Do you know enough of the story to know that God used her in some rather profound ways? Let's go back just a moment to the story itself. Now, some of us may, may question the morals and uh, the wisdom of the two young Israelite spies. Ooh, we're not in the army anymore. We just go check out the city. We may question their, their reasoning and rationale for ending up in Rahab's house, the woman of ill repute. Well, in one respect, it made perfect sense. Men and men coming and going from Rahab's house wouldn't have raised much alarm. That's just the way that house, uh, you know, operated. And so for them, as they came into the city of Jericho, they thought, well, she actually provides us with a perfect place of refuge, a perfect place of cover. But what we discover is that there are a few secrets in the city of Jericho that no sooner do they arrive that the king learns of their arrival and he immediately sends word, no doubt, by his own men to Rahab's house. I know they're there. Turn them over. And to me, this is where the story really gets interesting. Now, imagine for a moment somebody you don't know knocks on your door and you let them into the house and the police come to your house and say, we know they're in there. Uh, please send them out. And what are you going to do? Yep, here they are. Come on in. Take them away, whatever they've done, right? 
you know, you've got no investment. I mean, if the police are looking for them, they're probably bad. And, and why do you want them to be, you know, around you? It's like no investment. I'm not going to suffer. Here they are. Take them away. And that's where I think the story is so remarkable, is that her life doesn't need to be complicated. Yeah, the guys are here. Go ahead. Take them away. Um, do it with them, whatever you want. But she doesn't. And the question is, why doesn't she just simply turn them over? Now, I believe that there are two answers to that question. Uh, the first one is that Rahab honored the ancient custom of hospitality. And for many of us, we think of hospitality. Oh, Diane invites me over. Oh, she was very nice. She cooked a nice meal and we had dessert and she said pleasant things. And that's what we kind of view as hospitality. But in the ancient world, when, when uh, somebody came under the eaves of your roof, you had a responsibility to protect them even at the expense of your own life. And so these men come in and she says, their life for my life. The second reason I believe she did what she did is that Rahab had tremendous spiritual insights. She knew how things were going to go down. She knew that the Lord had given the city of Jericho into the hands of the Israelites. It was only a matter of time. And guess what? She wanted to be on the winning side. And we say, boy, was that rather self-serving. It is until we read her story as it's unfolded in Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 is the great what chapter? It's the great faith chapter. And there she is among all the other saints listed as a person of faith. And you can read about her in James chapter 2 as well, that what she did and why she did it was an expression of her faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You with me so far? So if we take the time to look closely at Rahab's life, we see that the Lord actually used her in three significant ways. And the first way in which the Lord used her for his good pleasure is that she served as the protector for the spies, right? She served as the protector. I mean, it's, it's interesting to read the story because she's, she's, she's with it. I mean, she is quick-witted. She is calm under pressure. The king's men come to her house, and she spins a wonderful story. She's not, uh, you know, in any way intimidated by that. In fact, she is so convincing. Give her an Academy Award. She is so convincing that they don't even bother to come into her house and search. And more than that, because of what she says, the king's men immediately undertake the proverbial wild goose chase. So the Lord uses her as a protector. Uh, the second way in which the Lord uses her is that she is a prophet of sorts. Is that she confirms for the spies what the Lord has already promised to do. So as we see in verse 9, it said, And she said to them, I know that the Lord, and, and that's a significant word. She doesn't talk about the generic God. But she says, I know that the Lord, that is the Lord's covenantal name, the one that he established with his, his people Israel. And so she's aware of this covenantal God who reaches out to the least of them, who takes them from their humble beginning and uses them in a glorious way. She says, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. And then in the second part of verse 11, we see that she has tremendous insight into the nature of God. She says, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She highlights God's sovereignty. Unlike the gods of the Canaanites and others, this is the one who, who reigns and rules in heaven above, and this is the one who reigns and rules on the earth below, even over the so-called gods of the Egyptians and the Ammonites and the Canaanites and all the other nations. 
So the Lord uses her as a protector and as a prophetess, and we've got to get the third P in there, right? It's the only way in which my mind works. Uh, he uses her as a procreator. And I know that this it really goes beyond the boundaries of today's text, but it certainly warrants mentioning that this woman who was an outsider, this woman who was a non-Israelite, this woman who was used by men, was ultimately used by God in fulfilling his promise of sending his son, Jesus. You ever look at the genealogy of Jesus? Rahab's name is listed. She's one of the few women that has the badge of honor of having her name listed that having been spared from destruction in the city of Jericho, the Lord used Rahab to be the great, 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 however many great grandmothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we revisit this familiar Bible story, it forces us to see Rahab not in one dimension, but in 3D. And in so doing, we, we discover something about her and the way in which the Lord worked in her and the way in which the Lord worked through her. And if we're brave enough, we also rediscover something about ourselves. And we also rediscover something about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And what we discover about or rediscover about ourselves is that we are no different from Rahab. You're thinking, surely, Pastor, I am better than Rahab. I mean, we may not do the same things that Rahab did, and, and by grace, hopefully, we're not. Um, but in the core of our beings, we're no different. It manifests itself in different ways. I mean, if we take God's word for what it is, Ephesians chapter 2, he says that by nature we are objects of God's wrath and therefore slated for destruction. We're no different than she is. Not only no different in terms of our need for God's grace, but also no different in the way in which God's grace comes to us. That like her, we are saved by God's grace through faith. In her case, though, the sign and symbol of her deliverance was a scarlet cord. For us, the sign and symbol of our deliverance is the cross of Christ. That God in his mercy sent Jesus, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Rahab, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That the same deliverance, the same redemption, the same salvation, the same forgiveness that she needed comes to us uh, through the, the crimson flood, through the, the scarlet blood that flowed from Jesus' head and his hands and his feet and his side. And what we rediscover also about Jesus is this, that he is at work in people's lives at times in people's lives that we would least expect it. That as we look at the lives of others, we see the messiness, but Jesus is looking at the heart. We see their, their present, which at times is filled with sin and shame, but Jesus looks to the future that where they are today is not necessarily where they will always be. That unbeknownst to us, God may well be working in them for his good pleasure and through them for his glory. That even though they are used and abused by others, God may well be using them for his own purposes. And so Rahab serves for us as a timeless and wonderful example of how the cord of God's scarlet grace wraps itself around someone's heart and transforms her life. Let us pray.
Father, you know that we can be very judgmental. That as we look at the lives of others around us, that their lives seem far messier than our own and far more sinful. And we pray that when we begin to see ourselves as being better, that you would remind us of where we were when you found us. That we were by nature objects of wrath, slated for destruction. And the only reason in which we have been delivered, the only which way in which we have been uh, forgiven and saved is by your grace extended to us in Jesus. Help us not to turn away from those who find them selves caught up in sin and shame, but rather grant us eyes that we might see that you are at work in places and in people that we would least expect it. Help us to rejoice that you are the kind of God who does not command us to, to draw near to you something we are unable to do, but you are one who condescends to meet us where we are. And we are grateful that you not only forgive us, but that as you wrap that scarlet cord of grace around our hearts, you change the trajectory of our lives. That while none of us have arrived yet, we are on the way for which we are grateful. And so we pray that even as you used Rahab for your good pleasure and for your glory, that you would see fit to use us for your good pleasure and for your glory. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.